Hi, my name is Tim, and in this video, I'm going to walk you through the transcription and translation activity that we're going to do in lab today. In the comments below, I'll put a link uh, to the paperwork and supplies you're going to need to do this lab. First, uh, you're going to need to cut out your DNA strand, your tRNAs, and your ribosome. Uh, next, you'll need to label your tRNA molecules with the correct anticodon sequence, and you will need to attach the correct paper clip to the correct tRNA as shown in this picture here. Uh, remember that you're copying DNA now into RNA, so in this case, your base pair rules change a little bit. The guanine pairs with the cytosine, the G with the C, just as before, but now the A is going to pair with the U. Adenine is going to pair with uracil. Okay. Uh, after this is completed, uh, you're ready for the process of translation, uh, which occurs in the cytoplasm outside of the nucleus of the cell. Start by getting your ribosome uh, like this, and then placing your mRNA sequence such that the first two codons are located in the P and A site, respectively. Our large and small ribosomal subunits are already connected in our example, so nothing needs uh, to be done here at this point. Now, find the tRNA that has the anticodon that is complementary match, is a complementary match to your mRNA that's in your P site, uh, as you see here. Uh, do the same thing for the codon in the tRNA that is in the A site. In this particular example, we have a blue paper clip and a red paper clip, as you see here. Uh, first, we're going to take the amino acid off of the tRNA that's in the P site, and we're going to transfer it to the amino acid that's on the tRNA in the A site, like this. Now, we're going to shift the entire mRNA and tRNA setup, both and then we're still going to stay attached. We're going to shift it to the left by one full reading frame or one codon. In this case, both the mRNA and tRNAs are going to move, and the result is the message RNA and tRNA that were in the A site will end up in the P site. This opens up the A site so that our next tRNA can enter with its corresponding anticodon, an amino acid, which in this case uh, is the green paperclip and the GUG anticodon. From this point, the process repeats. We're going to take the two amino acids on the tRNA um, in the P site, and we're going to transfer those to the amino acid on the A site, resulting in a blue, red, and green paperclip combination or amino acids. Attach the tRNA and the A site. In a real cell, these transfers and attachments of amino acids are controlled by enzymes. Once again, we now shift our mRNA molecule and corresponding tRNA to the left. The tRNA with no attached amino acids that are being pushed to the left will eventually reach the E site and will exit the ribosome. Uh, the shift to the left opens up the A site once again, uh, and our next tRNA enters, in this case, GAC with a white um, amino acid attached to it. And again, we transfer the chain of amino acids to the A site amino acids, and we continue by bringing our next tRNA, this time another red amino acid like this, and we shift our chain from the P site to the A site, and we continue to do that um, as we move along. And now we bring our next tRNA in, this time with our pink amino acid CUC on the anti-codon of the tRNA. And shifting our polypeptide chain of paper clips to the P site, to the uh, pink nucleotide in the chain. Um, and then we continue on like that that allows us to move the tRNA that's in the P site will now push to the E site and the remaining chain will be able to move to the left um, to open up the A site once again. So we continue the process just as before and in this next sequence you see we have another um, pink amino acid coming in. We continue the process we hook it to that one, and we continue to go until we reach a stop anticodon, 
as you see here. In this case, UAG is a stop anticodon, and that results then in the stopping point, and we reach the stop codon, and our amino acid chain, or polypeptide chain, will detach. And in this case, we now need to fold our amino acid to represent the final correct structure of our protein. So in this case, we'll now attach our last pink amino acid with our blue amino acid like this. In reality, the folding occurs uh, during the protein process of it being built. Some amino acids are electrically charged, some positive, some negative, some are neutral. And so those with electrical charges uh, that are opposite to one another will often result in folds and attractions uh, will form between certain amino acids resulting in different types of folds, as you see here. So this is the end of the um, final step of our original strain uh, of DNA. Now what we need to do is we need to do it all over again. And after you take a picture of your uh, protein, um, in that case, or draw it, um, we're gonna do the whole process again, but this time we're gonna use a different sequence of DNA and we're gonna use the sickle cell or the S type uh, DNA. And if you look carefully, the DNA looks almost the same, but there's a slight difference either way. So when you transcribe and translate the S-type gene, you end up with a protein like this instead, and the shape ends up being different. Um, either the blue amino acid attaches earlier or it does not attach to the last amino acid. Either way, the shape is different than the wild type, and the shape of the protein is extremely important to how it functions. Our simulation is designed to replicate the DNA transcription and translation example of wild type hemoglobin and the S or sickle cell hemoglobin type. The beta hemoglobin chain is 146 amino acids long, but the actual, actual genetic change occurs at the sixth amino acid location. The DNA sequence shown here have been slightly modified to make our kit work more smoothly, but the switch from glutamic acid to valine in the six codon sequence is the same change that occurs and the real example. And this single DNA change, the, this single DNA change results in a change in DNA and a change in the folding structure of the hemoglobin such that the normal red blood cells bend or become sickle shaped, ends up resulting in a wide range of circulatory problems uh, with those individuals that have this particular genetic trait.